Thank you. So welcome to the USC ERI SCEC uh, student chapter uh, seminars. And uh, today we are fortunate to have a speaker, uh, I think, uh, uh, Mitchell, uh, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, Kubilai Itchel Mars. Now, if you try and read the name, uh, you can understand why it's difficult to say it uh, when you are not trained in the Turkish language like I am. So, uh, Kubilai is working with Arab Gulf. He is an associate in Arab Gulf. He's a structural engineer. He was educated, as you will discover by his, by his accent, at University of Glasgow. He got his Bachelor's of Engineering from the University of Glasgow and his Master of Science from Imperial College with a specialization in earthquake engineering. Now he has worked in London, Los Angeles, Dubai, Abu Dhabi. He's an expert in suspension bridges, oil platforms, tall buildings, museums, high speed rail, and nuclear engineering. So today he's going to talk about one of his trips he did after the uh, earthquakes in Port-au-Prince this year, in January. He was there six weeks after the earthquake, and he's going to share with us his impression of the earthquakes in Haiti. So, keep it up. Thank you very much. Will you give me this? And you're on. Yes, you okay. Your that goes in my pocket. Thank you very much. I bet you return it. I will return it. I will try and remember. You'll have to remind me. Uh, thank you for the generous introduction. Um, I think the first thing was those lists of expertise. It's a range of projects I've worked on. Uh, I think I'll probably have a long way to go before I became an expert on them. Um, thank you for having me here to talk to you about AET. Uh, I have quite a few slides. Uh, I'm happy for you to interrupt me and ask me questions. There are, I think, over 100 slides. Uh, it is doing earthquake engineering for an aid agency uh, for the vulnerable people, basically people who could never affo afford to employ me or you once you're qualified, hopefully, as an engineer. And how that is different from the engineering we normally do. Uh, I'll give you a flavor of it from my aspect. And, you know, questions, ask and uh, we'll discuss it. So, um, generally these are the issues. There's some statistics. I'll talk about the country. We'll talk about damage assessment. Do you want to turn the light off? Maybe. Yeah. Shall I keep talking while that's happening? <laughs> yes? All right. So, um, you know, earthquake myths, I'll talk about earthquake myths. I think they're very interesting. They're totally non-scientific, but uh, I think there's more to them than, than the eye, sort of, when you first look at it. And, you know, agendas, who's wanting to do what, aid world, codes and standards, disaster reconstruction. Uh, we don't normally learn this at university. And interestingly, we don't really learn it at work either as a consultant engineer. Um, when I went to Haiti, this was the question I was really being asked to do. To facilitate the voluntary return of displaced families to their original neighborhoods, a better understanding of building damage is needed. And the reason is that everybody was starting to live in a camp under plastic sheeting. And there were buildings that hadn't collapsed, but everybody is still living in a camp. And that creates a lot of congestion in an urban city. It creates all sorts of problems. There's no sanitation. There are no toilets in camps and it creates disease and you know if engineers were able to look at buildings and find the good ones could that be used to persuade people to return um, question to you when I get off the plane you get labeled as an earthquake engineer what do you think the first question is that I get asked uh, safe is definitely in the right direction but it's more personal than that, it's more intimate than that. And it's not a personal, intimate thing, it's... Um, you know, the question is, will I sleep in this house? 
because, you know, when you arrive somewhere, everybody's always polite and they take you to where your accommodation is. And everybody's watching. Will you sleep in that building? Because if you don't, then you've spoken. It doesn't matter what you say. And uh, I was asked that question uh, in Pakistan in 2005 after the earthquake in Kashmir. I was very much asked that question. When I got off the helicopter, they walked me to the building and said, will you sleep here? And in Haiti, with the Oxfam staff, and this is the expatriate staff, the international staff, they asked me the same question. Haiti, I think we all know where it is, the little red thing. Um, it's again in the news because of the storm. Uh, where, where does Haiti sit in terms of the ecological footprint? Uh, three countries, four countries here, the UAE and the US. I'm working in the US quite a lot this year, and I live in the UAE. We, you know, the two of us, these two countries have a, the world's biggest ecological footprint. Pakistan, where I was after the 2005 earthquake, is pretty far down the list. And Haiti is a whole lot further down the list. I mean, you really can't get any poorer than that, a few more countries in the world. Um, to give you a sense of the economic impact, uh, this was some numbers from the government of Haiti. 120% of GDP was a direct economic loss from, from that earthquake. So, you know, that, and you don't have hospitals and you don't have schools and everything. So, um, three and a half million people were affected. Uh, you know, it's millions of people need shelter, water. Uh, this is from the UN. Uh, you know, I haven't gone and checked the latest statistics, but this was from April 2010. And earthquake consequence profiles. Uh, this is something that I've never, it was never mentioned to me at university. Uh, and it's never mentioned when I do earthquake engineering uh, for project work. A bunch of earthquakes between 1972 and 1990. And you look at the direct loss and you compare that to the GDP or GNP of that country and you work out a percentage and you can see that for small and poor countries earthquakes are very devastating so even though the Loma Prieta earthquake of 1989 was by far the most costly earthquake on this list in terms of the nation's sort of wealth it was 0.2%, I think, if I'm reading that correctly. So it was, in the bigger picture for the US, it was insignificant. For Haiti, it's destroyed the country. And when we do our earthquake engineering codes, we don't look at what the consequence of damage and destruction is to a place at a big picture level. You know, a small place doesn't seem to be able to afford the same level of damage as a larger place. Uh, who's doing what in Haiti? Uh, you've got self-help, UN, World Bank, international non-government organizations, NGOs. US military was very active in the early days, the first six weeks. Uh, you've got overseas Haitians. And then at the bottom of the list for a few weeks, me and a colleague, uh, we went to Haiti to help Oxfam. Um, self-help remains the most important uh, quality that is required. And immediately after a disaster, it is always self-help who are the first people to react. It takes, you know, days, weeks, months to mobilize a proper response. Um, the U.S. found this out in Hurricane Katrina. You're just not prepared for it. Um, the, a devastating earthquake like that happens. It's the people in the room, your neighbors, who are going to help you. So they are the biggest and most consistent source. It's a poor country. Uh, I didn't see this, but you know, people make uh, basically mud pies. They get a bit of flour and oil and they mix it with some clay type material and it fills your stomach. So it, it really is a poor place. Uh, the US military was there to help. Uh, I think they were concerned about basically the breakdown of law and order. And they had a large presence. The UN was also there. They were there as a stabilizing force, patrolling the streets. Um, this was a map produced by, in February, by Ocha from the UN. And it just gives you an indication of the number of aid agency type, goodwill type organizations. There were 984 
who had sort of registered in some form or another. So if you think of an organizational point of view for the government of Haiti, you've got all these organizations, individuals, large, small groups coming, wanting to help. And you're a government whose infrastructure and buildings have been destroyed. And you have to deal with all these organizations, all these foreigners who don't speak Creole, who don't know the country, who need accommodation, food. You know, how does that work? It's a logistics nightmare. Uh, the, U the United Nations does have a website called One Response. It tries to bring together the various players and international organizations so that coordination can happen, so that aid is distributed equally and equitably, that duplication doesn't happen, so you know, that one family doesn't get five tenths and they'll sell four on the market to their neighbor. Yeah? Uh, it is an effort, but uh, it's, it's difficult in the field. Um, just jumping back to the economics, you know, how much money has the international community pledged or is the international community giving to Haiti? Here are a couple of guesstimates, you know, 1.5 billion to 13 billion US dollars. And an estimate when I did this table some months ago was that 300,000 houses needed to be rebuilt. So if you take the dollar number and divide it by the number of houses, you end up with how much money you've got per house. And then if you divide that by a cost, what it costs to build a house per square meter or per square foot, uh, you know, you don't end up with a lot of house, no matter how you stack it up. And you still have to pay for salaries, World Food Program, aid agency staff, roads, infrastructure, schools, hospitals, and the list continues. So it is very little money to reconstruct a society. Um, moving on to myths. Uh, hopefully I'll link in together why myths are interesting. Uh, myths are interesting because they are our cultural memory. And in Canada, in Vancouver way, the Native Americans, uh, and I'm not totally familiar with the mythology, but there is a story about thunderbirds and whales fighting and clashing. And I'm sure there are people who are more eloquently versed with these stories, but it was a markation of earthquakes happening. Because the thunderbird and the whale signifies the earthquake near Seattle, Vancouver, and the tsunami coming in. Basically, the whale is splashing about, the waves are coming in. And they have, apparently, some of their significant religious sculptures or temples that mark out the extent of that uh, tsunami inundation. Is it a myth? Is it just a story to frighten young children? Or is it a way to record tragic historic events for the next generation to remember. In Turkmenistan they have a statue built in uh, Ashgabat and the belief is that the world sits on the head of an ox and that occasionally it moves its head because it's sore on one side and every time it moves its head the earth shakes. I mean, is it true? No, but that's not the point. And the point is in these societies there does seem to be historic records, cultural records of earthquakes. In Japan, you've probably heard of this one in Japan, it's the catfish. And if you can't hold it down, it shakes under the sea and then earthquakes and tsunamis happen. Um, earthquakes and fires. Uh, Lisbon in, I think it was 1755, San Francisco, uh, Italy, Messina, and then Kobe in 2005. So right through history, Earthquakes and fires are closely associated. They don't always happen. In Port-au-Prince, I saw very little evidence of any fires. So, uh, you know, I think on this one they got lucky because it was a dense urban environment and you'll see later that it's open fire stoves. So if it falls over, there's plenty of stuff to burn. For some reason, the place didn't burn. So uh, they got lucky on this one. But on the issue of myths, when I was in Port-au-Prince in Haiti, I didn't find any stories from any local people in repeatedly asking 
no, there was no institutional memory in that society of earthquakes. Whereas when I was in Pakistan, I would ask people about it. And in Pakistan, the belief is similar to in Turkmenistan. The story that people did remember was something about an uh, ox or, you know, there was that sort of resemblance of a story in people's minds. So there, there was a memory in the culture. In Haiti, there was none that I could find. But I was only there for two weeks. So, you know, it wasn't a long time. But now we know better, right? We've, we've worked out plate tectonics. We started measuring activity to detect nuclear bombs after World War II and we've suddenly started measuring P waves and S waves and we've put together where the boundaries are and convection currents. So we're better informed. But this is only the science of the last 50, 60 years. So that before that it was myths. Um, so the earthquake happened. It was reasonably shallow. It was in a dense urban area and was it a big earthquake? Was it a small earthquake? Uh, it was a certainly a devastating earthquake. Here's the sort of the main faults going through Port-au-Prince, Haiti, and Jamaica, and you know the neighboring countries. So, you know, okay, Port-au-Prince was the one that got hit uh, in sort of a big, in a big way. But a lot of the neighboring countries are also prone to earthquakes, and I suspect not that well prepared. And what's in interesting about this institutional loss of memory about earthquakes, here is a historic map of earthquakes in the region. And it is full of them. But somehow that hasn't been translated into the next generation. Now everybody's aware of it again. But, you know, it came at a cost. Um, this is a question I've been asked. Uh, what should we do about the ground motion if I'm going to design something? Where do you start? You know, I've, I've got the benefit of knowing what to look for. I can go to the seismological papers, I can go to USGS, I can go to Embraces or Joyner and Bohr and find the seismic hazard maps from various studies. They're all different. But I think to this date there is not a seismic hazard map by the uh, government of Haiti. So from a designer's point of view, what do you take? And you have to, I suppose, take something reasonable. You will start looking at the codes from the neighboring countries. Who has uh, who may have an earthquake code. The USGS, do you believe it, or is that just interpolated between different studies? Because certainly, you know, they've done a good effort to try and cover the world, but it has meant interpolation in places where data is missing. Um, hurricanes, uh, historic hurricanes. Hur um, Haiti is prone to those. So from a designer's point of view, it's not just inertia that is important and we need to limit the mass and control that. But the mass is precisely what you want to resist strong winds and heavy rains. And, um, you know, I, I took this, uh, this is from the 2nd of November, that's uh, yesterday. Uh, the aid agencies and governments are trying to prepare for the possibility that Hurricane Thomas is going to sweep through the country. And, you know, it's disaster upon disaster. And in a way, it's not surprising because the place is so vulnerable that even if this isn't a big storm, it turns into a disaster because they are so exposed. So we, we will see what will happen in the next few days on this one. Uh, in some ways, it's in the news because it's like, will it happen, will it not happen? It's slightly gratuitous. Uh, but, you know, I wouldn't want to be there at the moment. So uh, damage assessment is what I went to do there. And uh, now we've got the benefit of GPS type things. So uh, Kathy, who was with me, she had a GPS device and tracked. So we went around Port-au-Prince, the city, up and down, left and right, and uh, looked at different types of facilities. So I will go through these, and I'll go through these probably at a faster pace. And <coughs> again, interrupt me. Some general views. This is at the outskirts of Port-au-Prince, on the hills, looking out towards the main city and the harbour, you can see total destruction on the left. The hillside, all the buildings have come down. On the right, it doesn't look as bad. Here's a close-up on the left. Like the buildings have all come down like mini avalanches, little landslides. Um, but, you know, I'm looking left, they've all come down. I'm looking right, they're all standing. I don't know why. Was the bedrock 
closer to the surface on the right-hand hill compared to the left-hand hill? What was different about all the terraces? Was it just less densely built? But, you know, there are these, uh, we can speculate. Uh, damage assessment on a building like this, this had an extra floor. The ground floor has totally gone. Um, it's not there. And then you come across something like this. I'm being asked to assess this building. It's a school building. It used to be a school. It's now an orphanage. But the building has hardly got a crack in it, but there's nobody sleeping in it. <coughs> and there were about four of these buildings. Nobody sleeping in them. They're frightened. So I went and did an assessment of it, and the building is absolutely fine. It's got all the band beams. It's got regular layout. It's got internal walls, large wall area. But I didn't have the authority to say that this is all right, because the authority to say that the public building is all right lies with the government of Haiti. And I wasn't given that mandate to have that responsibility. <coughs> so, you know, I met the person in charge of this and explained to them uh, what I thought and did the damage assessment form and gave it to the Oxfam who gave it to the government of Haiti. But it's difficult for those lines of communication. In California, training, active training of structural engineers is to do damage assessment, to get qualified and to be on the register to do that. You know, that's an active process. So there is prepare preparation going on. In Haiti, there was that, that was lacking. Uh, this is, I'm trying to find out what the building is made out of. So we got a hammer and broke a little bit of the building. Um, the children, the orphans, they're quite happy to help. And they were all quite m magically surprised that if you put a bit of water onto some concrete stuff, suddenly it becomes clear because all the dust is washed away. And you can see, oh, it's made up of solid bricks. And, you know, they, they enjoyed the engagement. We looked at some middle class properties, um, stone masonry, concrete. I mean, you know, architecturally, that's quite a challenging shape at the best of times. But you know what? It stood up. Okay, <coughs> it had some damage, but it didn't collapse on top of people. Um, you know, this is us looking, talking to the ho house owners. This is a picture taken by the side of the road. The floors have just fallen down like sheets of fabric on the buildings below. The walls have collapsed. And then you have an old building like this, very symmetrical layout. And um, it, seems to, it seems to have worked, didn't collapse and they are extending it. And then you have uh, concrete on a budget. I mean, in the rocks, the stones in there, it just looks as though somebody's dug some soil with rocks, stones in it, and just put it into some formwork with a little bit of cement. It doesn't look like concrete. The reinforcement has disappeared due to corrosion. And, uh, you know, that is construction. You look for a wall section, there's a bit of brick here and there, there's a lot of mud and sand and goodwill. And then right next to that building is this building. And I mean, is this in LA? I mean, it could well be a four-story timber frame house that uh, some of us live in here. And that's right next to the collapsed building. So not everything did poorly in Haiti. And then you have buildings like this. Uh, can you see the scaffolding tubes propping up the checkered building? I mean, those scaffolding tubes are only about that diameter. There are about four of them or five of them propping up the whole building. At least somebody had the foresight to prop it, right? But I mean, I would probably want 50 of those underneath there. Then you have building failures like this. It's as if it's just a little mini landslide. Because the, like the hills are quite steep, they build terraces. And then they put the building on top of the terrace. So if the terrace fails, the whole lot just uh, goes down. So even if the structure might have been all right on top, once the terrace has gone, the building goes. Catena reaction. This is why we tie things together. This is why the detailing matters. When you do your rebar detailing and you do your minimum embedment lengths and things like that, it actually works, right? I mean, catena reaction, it has stopped it from completely collapsing. Demolition. It'll just happen with you know, a guy on his sledgehammer. They'll just chip away at it and they will then recycle all the rebar that's been damaged. It, that's what will happen. And this is a building that's a little bit further down the line. And this was six weeks, seven weeks after the earthquake. So people are active in reconstructing right from the start. They are breaking away the concrete to pick out the reinforcement. 
that there is the reinforcement that was in a floor, in a concrete floor. And it was typically all flat slabs in a relatively high seismic region. And as you probably know, flat slabs and earthquakes uh, don't really mix very well. But standard practice. And the floors were not even solid concrete. They were filled with concrete hollow blocks. Um, this was an interesting thing. The most construction I saw six, seven weeks after the earthquake was people building walls, not houses. But the security situation there was such that people needed to build a wall to make sure that their property or land was safe. And only then could they start thinking about building shelter. So it's interesting that you have to invest in building a wall to make sure that your house doesn't get robbed and your belongings don't get robbed. And I suppose it's a reflection of how difficult operating conditions are there. Um, this building here, what do you think is special about this one? I mean, first of all, it didn't collapse, right? I mean, it didn't collapse. The one on the right, on the left, they were a little bit more ropey. But this is a movement joint in the building. And there's a tile that's been tiled across the movement joint. And the tile has not broken. And tiles are not strong things. So this building hardly moved. The earthquake was not even strong enough to break a tile. And I checked this on a couple of levels. Each floor was like that. And the reason is that uh, I then met the owner. The owner was in the building. And the owner had photos of them constructing this house, this building. Uh, some 10, 15 years ago. And for whatever reason, they dug down to bedrock and they built a strong foundation. It's all smooth reinforcement bars. Doesn't necessarily have seismic hooks everywhere. I mean, you know, it might have a seismic hook, then it's, I think, more by luck than by design. But they put the reinforcement in, they dug down to bedrock, they built a solid foundation. And um, that pride and that spending on quality and keeping the building relatively simple has meant that they, their building is undamaged except for the pounding from the adjacent buildings. Um, this was a aid agency from Haiti. We were asked to look at their house because they were living in it and trading in it and doing their work. And you look at it from the outside, top left, it looks okay. And then as you start going in and downstairs on the slope, I mean, you know, once I went into that room and found that the walls inside underneath this floor had fallen away and that the floor was crumbling, I was like, okay, it's time to get out and it's time to advise them to move out of there. But people are living in that building and trying to do their aid agency work. This building here on the left, I was sincerely asked, looking at that building, if we could use it again. And well, what do you say? You say, well, we'll have a look. And you take a walk around the building. And then at the back of the building, there is this addition, bottom left. It's a small concrete block, concrete frame thing, and it's relatively undamaged. So the advice is, well, if you can demolish the bits that have really fallen apart and not break this bit, then you've got s part of the structure you can use. But, you know, when you stand in front of this and people are asking you, can you use that building again? Uh, it seems a bit farcical, right? But it's not that funny for them. Um, and then we come to the poor people, the really poor people. Um, this is the houses that they live in, the metal shacks. And what's interesting is these houses didn't suffer any damage. These will get blown away in the hurricane and they'll get damaged under those events. But under the earthquake, some of these houses did just fine. Um, concrete masonry houses, just concrete blocks. Some of them did all right, some of them didn't do all right. This picture here of this wall coming towards you is not because I used a fish-eyed lens to get a sort of a bent picture of the bricks. The wall was just about to fall out and it was coming towards you. For some reason it didn't fall out. But those children that you saw earlier, you know, they were living in this house. So living conditions are tough. And then you have structures like this, where the road goes underneath it, with this little column. I mean, I don't know what's holding it up, but it didn't fall down. 
So when you do your earthquake engineering and you learn about regularity and these rules, yeah, sure, they're really sensible. But then things like this also work, and there's been no engineering in it. And why, I couldn't tell you. But, um, you know, sometimes some of these wonderful shapes can be made to work, and if with a bit of engineering, they would work better. Typical reinforcement detailing, four bars at a tiny little column. If you're lucky, you can see the, sort of the concrete quality. It's very porous. Uh, there is very little construction quality going on. A Cite Soleil, this is where there were all the troubles uh, some years ago, uh, and I was asked to help Oxfam specifically to look at some of the warehouses there. And it, the warehousing is absolutely key to Oxfam's aid distribution. Their water purification equipment, the bladders. Bladders are large plastic bags that can hold, I don't know, 500 gallons of water or something that they set up, stand pipes, blankets, food. It all has to be warehoused before it gets distributed. So can you look at a warehouse? Yeah, sure, I can go and look at a warehouse. And you go and look at this warehouse, and that's the warehouse in which they're operating. And the back of it has collapsed. You know, you can see the pictures. On the top right-hand side where the yellow arrow is, there was some reinforcement off the wall hooked around the truss. So the truss is now bent, holding up the wall. Y and what's, what's the option to Oxfam? You look at the roof truss connections and you can see the ductility demand, the deformation that's gone on to those critical truss to concrete connections. They've been severely damaged. I tell Oxfam, oh, you can't live in here, you can't work in here, it's a red tag, move out. What do they do then? Well, there aren't any other warehouses lying around that are in a good state of affair. And then this is another one that I was asked to look at. And it was in the same warehouse complex, so the construction type was similar, so the damage patterns were similar. And typically the one that worried me most was the roof truss to concrete connection, as you can see on the top. Um, so what did we do? Um, we wrote some conclusions that they need to take some action, some urgent action. And my assumption is that they'll take this urgent action within 30 to 45 days. These are common sense suggestions based on engineering principles. They haven't done any engineering analysis. Nobody's done a calc. I haven't measured a rebar. If the owner is unwilling to do these immediately, then you should, as a matter of urgency, look to move out. So there's a bit of a give and, you know, there's a give and take. Here are some s engineering suggestions. And if you implement them, then you can buy yourself a bit of time while you find more suitable warehousing. And if they can't do anything about it, then move out. But where do you move to? Uh, you have to find something that works. A uh, FEMA 154, building typologies. This is interesting because uh, FEMA, you know, these are the typical building typologies in FEMA 154. It's used around the world quite often, but it's very US-centric. So when I was there looking at buildings, I looked at how many of these do we have in Port-au-Prince for the buildings I saw, and not that many. What I did come up with was that there's an alternative list of building classifications that are based on the construction types in Haiti. Because when you're doing assessments of buildings in Haiti, it's about the building stock in Haiti. So we use our international guidelines and textbooks and classifications, because you do need to try and limit the size of the problem. How many of these buildings have I got? How many of those buildings? So, you know, stone masonry, uh, timber corrugated galvanized iron walls and roof. It's just a tin shed. And actually a lot of people live in them. So, you know, how do we do earthquake engineering for those? So we've got some of those buildings here, uh, the different building typologies. The poorest of the poor, they, you know, they live in these, these, these shacks. Then we've got a, a level up. It's a one to two bedroom concrete block building with a some form of a concrete uh, timber truss on it with some corrugated sheeting. Then the next level up, it's probably two or three bedrooms, rooms, and it's got a slight small concrete frame with hollow concrete block infill, openings typically on one side, built against the hillside on a terrace. Then you've got stone masonry buildings. Uh, 
Uh, what's interesting, you can see this is out on the countryside. Or, I mean, it was only a 20 minute drive from the city centre. But you've got rainwater harvesting going on. The, the more rural you got, suddenly they were self sufficient. They were collecting rainwater. And you've got stone masonry foundations. This is in built up Port au Prince. Stone formed a large part of the foundation for very many structures, whether it was retaining walls, uh, boundary walls, the leveling of the ground for buildings. And how often do you study stone masonry in your civil engineering, structural engineering course? I mean, it's, it's not on our textbooks, but in a setting like Haiti, it's a huge ingredient of the construction. So there's some conclusions on damage assessment. Um, you can find uh, a lot of this work on the EERI website under, I think it's the Haiti bit. There is uh, this report where this is all is, uh, it's uploaded. Um, damage assessment training, you need to learn principles, you need classroom training, field training, you need to learn about temporary shoring, you need to learn about demolition. You know, there's a whole suite of things that people need to learn. Uh, wider considerations, urban master planning. And a lot of those built up places, you can't even get a fire truck in. So if there is a fire, how do you put the fire out? There are no roads, or the roads pass underneath a house. I mean, that's not a sensible way to arrange uh, sort of urban living. Land rights issues. Uh, it's not an engineering issue, but a lot of people in Haiti were tenants. So they don't own the land, and they don't own the house. And the house has collapsed. Why should they knock it down and rebuild it? It doesn't belong to them. And if they do knock it down, what's, been you know, what's fallen down, and rebuild it, will they have a right to remain tenants in that house for a w reasonable while? Or will the landlord throw them out and now charge nice rent because they've got a finished house? So you've got to find the right incentives in society for reconstruction. And in Haiti, there are lots of tenants. Um, damage assessment. Can Arab help with this? Yes, I think we can. Does it matter? Is the data correct? Uh, this was from Pakistan. Uh, I got some data from one of the UN people. And they looked at fatalities per household. And the green, dark green, was few fatalities per household. And the red stuff was uh, a high casualty rate, fatality rate. And then we plotted building damage statistics. And you'd expect where you had heavy building damage, you would have a high number of fatalities. Uh, there wasn't really any correlation, because the damage assessment that was done, one person took the view that, oh, nothing is damaged, we can't show damage, that's too embarrassing. In another place, the view was, we have to show all the damage so we can get all the help we can receive. But from an aid point of view, it is unhelpful. Here, you know, I counted 22 buildings on this photo, I counted 47 tents, and I don't really see a collapsed building. So there are 47 tents being used by people who don't have collapsed buildings. How does that help the aid work and reaching the people who really need the support and the help? So damage assessment is totally important to identify who does need help and where your efforts should go. And you know, damage assessment, you can't do it from up above from satellite photos. Uh, you might be able to, if you can get is isometric pictures where you join two pictures together so you can get a 3D type view. But generally you can't. This building here, <coughs> the one with the shutters, you look at it from the front and it looks fine. And then you walk around, you know, the photo on your right is taken from here. And you walk around the building and it's partially collapsed. And if you only look at it from one end, you won't, you won't see the problems. This is a mosque, f shop floors, the floors have fallen down. So <coughs> it is engineering delivered through appropriate training to all who have a stake in construction to improve building quality, to reduce vulnerability. And I, the more I think about it, the more I come to the conclusion that the built environment, the custodians of that, is the engineering, civil, structural, engineering, the people in the built profession. It's not doctors, it's not politicians, you know, we're the ones who deal with structural collapse or try and prevent all of that happening. Uh, some observations here about housing stock. 
How many engineers physically build houses, especially in poor countries? You know? Who builds them? It's not the qualified people, it's not you and me. It's the people at the bottom, the craftsmen and the laborers. But then let's look at the investment. You know, in lots of countries, we spend all the money on a few people who don't build houses. And the population lives in houses. Interestingly, in lots of uh, developing countries, even rich people have their houses built by laborers and craftsmen who haven't necessarily received a lot of training in technical matters, in craftsmanship and uh, engineering detailing. So it's unsurprising that you end up with all sorts of difficulties in the housing stock. So what do you have to do? You do have to try and engage with people. And this was a training that I was doing in uh, Pakistan, in Kashmir. You find the masons, the builders, the 35 to 45 year olds, the 50 year olds, and you t teach them about earthquakes, why they happen to start with. They need an explanation. And you try to teach it to the women in Pakistan, male, female, have to be separate. So you do the lecture twice and you teach them about building regularity and just very basics at least have an appreciation of the concepts so that when you are planning your house if you are going to build yourself that it has been influenced in some part by sensible principles you might only pick up 20% of it but that's a lot better than nothing you know we talked about site selection why would anybody build their house next to a ravine without a retaining wall and a safe distance from the edge but this is master planning. You know, who gave permission for these types of things to be, to be done? And then you've got this gentleman here with his son busily reconstructing. But three, four hundred meters above his ground, above his house, is this. There's a giant fissure in the hillside. And it's, it's a landslide that's just waiting to happen. There's a crack that's developed. So, you know, he's building his house and underneath it, uh, he's underneath it. You've got a view like this, and you don't even need to study the engineering or hydrology. It just looks like a river, right? It looks like a river, and for all intents and purposes, it is a river. That's why it's that shape. But urban population has meant that people have come and started building, and which is why I suppose in Pakistan, over the summer, the floods have been so devastating, in that so many people have built in floodplains. And then you've got the people on the top here. Okay, they didn't build in the floodplain, but they've built right on the edge next to uh, the hill that's crumbling. So you discuss this. And is it just the locals who do these things? Well, it's not. You see the plot on the left here that's being flattened and graded. That was a large international, multinational aid agency building a field hospital. Somebody had told them they can have land. And if anybody tells you you can have land for free, alarm bells, please. Nobody gives you land for free if there isn't a problem with the land. And here the issue was that, well, it's just not that safe. It's next to an unstable slope. Uh, for whatever it was going on, my only advice was to them, if you can't change anything about it, at least rotate the building by 180 degrees so that all the beds are on this side. Because that's the people who are sleeping and least likely to be able to get out. You, d you take photos like this, same village. And you point out to people that, well, you know, all these houses are on the edge. And you have a room like this with the masons and the carpenters. And you, you need to take photographs of their own village, town. There's no point in showing California examples or Turkey examples. They live here. It's their community. It's like you taking your car to the mechanic. There's no point in him telling me that, on general, an A4 Audi has this type of problem. I don't drive an Audi, I drive a Citroen or whatever, right? I need to know about my car. So you need to make it relevant to people in the examples. And then we practice building layout. This was a I took this photo because it was quite unusual to find somebody who could, in that setting, draw with pen and paper and plan. What people were more comfortable with was string and chalk. And you just plan full size. And it was a simple problem. I've got a house, land this many meters by that many meters. I want a room, three bedrooms, a toilet, a kitchen, a bathroom. Lay it out, please. And people would go and practice, and then they would come up with all these shapes, and then you'd say, yeah, but you need doors and windows. 
and then you would try and look at the building. Is it regular? Is it symmetric? Have you perforated one side of the building completely through all the windows and doors to try and get this idea that they need to think about the layout? And then we take pictures of local construction practice. And, you know, I'm giving the class a couple of hundred meters, a few hundred yards away from this. Everybody knows in that audience where this was when I showed it to them. And then we do the practical, and then the guy with the red turban bandana comes out, and he goes, I'll, I'll show you a connection. And then he disappeared for 15 minutes, and then he came back. And he's totally confident that the connection works. And I said, okay, show me. So, no problems. So they do the load test, instant testing. Yeah? Somebody holds it up, he stands on it. Okay, it works. So, I mean, isn't that an improvement over this? And this guy, amongst the same group of people, has the know-how and skills. So you need to identify people like that and bring their skills to people's attention. And then, uh, in this case, the, the military who were there doing humanitarian work for all intents and purposes, they joined in on the training session. So every week I had a training session and they come along and they learn the detailing. Uh, it was a little bit disruptive when a more senior person came because suddenly the whole class stopped because everybody was being respectful. So we did have to have a discussion about maybe it's time that you left. Thank you for your audience and everything and your time. And, you know, he, he was great. He, 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 he took the hint and left and we were able to continue the class. But it was this, in this environment, authority suddenly stops everything because it's a person of seniority and then everything stops. That doesn't help anybody. It's nice, but it doesn't help anybody. Concepts of bracing. I mean, it seems totally obvious to you, right? But what are you doing bracing a building on the outside like that with a piece of wood stuck in the ground? But nobody's been to school. Nobody's studied engineering. It's not that obvious. Somebody's come up with a different solution how to stop the building from feeling a little bit shaky. You know, with all that corrugated sheeting, it wasn't put together well enough for the building to be at least half stiff. So, you know, people do come up with some solutions. Or, there again, uh, you can come up with this, where you do get the builders, and you put them into a classroom, and you teach them about bracing. The models are not expensive. You know, I don't take anything with me when I'm doing it. You just ask a local carpenter or somebody to, I need a 2 by 4 or whatever, I need you to do this for me, and they go away and they're a little bit bemused by it. And then you do the practicalities. You can do this frame without any bracing and you can get somebody to push it. Then you can put one brace in, you can push it in one way, the brace locks, it's in compression and it works. You push it the other way, the brace goes into tension and the whole thing falls. Ah, so you need stiffness in both directions, you need stiffness and strength in both directions. You practice detailing. Because a lot of these people, they've always worked with their hands. You know, they are the masons and carpenters of the community. So giving them a lecture in a classroom or handouts is pretty alien. So you have to go into the field and spend hours with them. And you practice the detailing. Okay, we've got mud. Right? Mud was easy in terms for play mortar. But it's how to make stone masonry strategic reinforcement. Is this a code compliant building? I have no idea. Show me where I can find the equation that will tell me what the capacity of a stone masonry wall is. I don't have uh, equations like that. Uh, you could do the reinforcement through bands of timber. And you can do the same for uh, solid clay brick masonry. We practice reinforce detailing for a concrete construction. Everybody aspires to a concrete house. Very few of them can afford it. But at least have an idea of what the hooks and the number of links you need. And if you get those right, at least it's got a half chance of standing. And we built these and left them there as examples, full-scale examples. Uh, stone masonry workshops. So, you know, this is how we did a workshop. You get a tractor driver with his trailer and we've loaded it up with stone because we're going to practice stone masonry. And then uh, there was a, a, tr uh, a prototype house being built. So I took a couple of the classes there when they were within walking distance, you know, you need to dig down and build a foundation. This is what it looks like. Here is a stone masonry house. There is strategic reinforcement here. It's got one rebar at the columns and that wall interfaces or where there is a door. 
and then it's got a few band beans, it's got three stones. Um, you know, it's got a strategic reinforcement. It's not a code building. You do your workshop there. You take people to construction sites and you show them. And in some ways, a building half built is better than a completed building. Because once it's completed, they'll plaster it and they'll finish it and you won't see anything. In this stage, it was very useful. And our NSET, this is a Nepalese Society of Earthquake Technology, uh, they, they have this wonderful way of demonstrating appropriate earthquake engineering technology. So they get a mason to build two houses, in this case a stone masonry house, one with strategic reinforcement as we've just seen uh, here, and it's a little, sits on a little shake table, and one without the strategic reinforcement as they normally build them. Same number of doors, windows, openings, same floors, and they put them on a shake test. So I'll let this happen for a few minutes. The water tank on the top on the all-white building isn't braced or bolted down. Just a couple of holding down bolts would have saved that water tank. Very bespoke. I mean, there's not a huge amount of science behind it, but it is so convincing that you can, within reasonable means, do things to improve the performance of even stone masonry. The damage pattern and the way that looks, it's, I mean, it's just like the photos after earthquakes. And you can do this for different types of construction. And it's not tri-directional scientific and mass scaling hasn't been done. on from that but it's, it's a very powerful way of communicating um just back to Haiti just observing things as you walk by you know people are immediately six weeks after the earthquake reinforcement is being collected metal scrap metal concrete bricks uh, sorry uh, clay bricks solid clay bricks are being piled where they haven't been damaged stone is being stacked the one thing that was never being stacked was concrete hollow blocks they were just being thrown away it was just rubble um, <laughs> I made the mistake of going into this house because I approached the house and I was asked to look at it. Um, you know, this lady's there. And the house doesn't look that bad from the front, right? And you go into the next room and it's just nobody's living in it. It looks a bit awful. But and then you get a little bit further in, deeper inside the house, and it's like, oh, the staircase has collapsed. Well, maybe time to go out and walk around the house. What I should have done to start with. And then you look at the back of the house. I mean, the house has fallen away. So you do need to, when you post disaster damage situations, always walk around whatever it is you're meant to look at. If I had s made that effort, I wouldn't have ever gone into that building. So, okay, I got away with it. Uh, food and beverage. There are a few things here that are very precious to aid agencies. You know, it's about helping the vulnerable. It's about eating water immunization, cooking conditions, living conditions. It's not engineering, but it's all the things that make a structure a home. Because unless a structure is a home, there's little point in 
columns and beams. So, you know, typically cooking environment in Haiti, open fires, um, power generation, everything by generators, everybody's got generators everywhere. And uh, on the top right hand side, there's a guy with a little green generator and you can pay money and charge your mobile phone. And he's making a living out of that. Uh, laundry, the half constructed reinforcement cages, so there's great laundry lines for stringing string and hanging up the washing. Water supply, you've got here in some of the camps, uh, traditional rainwater harvesting, drainage in the makeshift camps, absolute disaster. And uh, bottom right hand side, little plastic bags of water. I've never seen that in the world. You can just buy little, you know, half a liter, half liter 500 millimeter plastic bags of water. Um, that was being sold in the camps at a, at a profitable rate, I believe. Sanitation, uh, not many, one between 20 houses, I think, on average in this community, this poor community where I looked at 40 houses. You had latrines. These were the ones that aid agencies had built in the camps. You've got waste disposal, generally just not happening. And then good proportions do work. You know, one day I was uh, needing to do some groceries, went to the shop that people had told me has got stuff, and you come across this building, right? I mean, the columns are bigger than the beams, everything lines up, there's not a crack in this building. So good proportions really go a long way. Um, and then you've got the rich part of town, uh, you know, nice large houses. Uh, they seem to be fine. Um, this is an interesting thing here. These were the railway track. I understand, uh, not 100% sure on this story, but it was explained to me that there used to be a railway. There used to be. Well, the only evidence I found was in the rich part of town where the railway track had been used to reinforce the walls. I mean, they're nicely reinforced retaining walls, but it's not often you see railway track for reinforcement sections. Stone masonry, back to this. I mean, stone masonry was used a lot. Uh, I mean, bottom right hand side, that's me standing and you've got this seven, eight, nine, ten meter stone infill wall holding up this uh, factory. And actually the stone part is done all right. It's the concrete block, the concrete frame bit that hasn't done that well. You've got large retaining walls going through the middle of the town where the rivers run when it is wet. The German Bordschaft, the Deutsche Bordschaft stone masonry. Um, so, you know, it's not on our books normally. Uh, I've got a, a different view of Port-au-Prince. Uh, it's a colleague, a friend of mine, Randolph Langenbach. He lives in San Francisco. He kindly gave me permission to show you some of his slides. Uh, he went there after probably six, eight weeks after I did, and he looked at some very different structures. And they are really quite magnificent. So. You know, apart from all the poor quality concrete and concrete block, you've got these gingerbread district houses. And this is after the earthquake. And, you know, they are really quite magnificent. And typically, they're a bit like Kolombaj, uh, or in Pakistan, Daji Dawari. It is timber frame, very small members with infill masonry. And the framing has been panelized so that the masonry only ever has to span very short distances. Uh, you can see it here more closely. So the masonry panels are very, very small. Uh, absolutely beautiful houses, a wonderful heritage for Haiti. Um, obviously, they're not your average poor person's house. It was in a nice part of town. But, uh, you know, they've all survived the earthquake. Um, this was a stone house to some degree with the uh, colombage construction at the top where you can see the timber bracing and the stone infill. Um, here is a building with stone infill again. So stone is a huge construction material. And I, I, I don't understand why we don't study it at university. Um, if I look at historic structures in the world, they're probably the only material that is truly durable. It doesn't rust. Uh, there was a quality concern about some of the stone here, that some of it wasn't uh, totally hard enough. But generally, I mean, we probably should do better with stone. Here you've got uh, one of these houses. You know, it's suffered that level of damage and it hasn't collapsed. These concrete, uh, these timber floors and structures are not as heavy as concrete buildings. And the spans and geometries that people attempt are less adventurous. 
So maybe that goes a long way towards making these buildings stand up. And uh, here are a couple of pictures um, that Randolph took uh, some months after I'd been there. And frankly, it looked worse, I think, than uh, when I was there back in end of February, beginning of March. Uh, it's a difficult upper place to work and live. There's no place to put the rubble. The only place to put the rubble is on the street. So, you know, the sooner if you cleared it up, the more space you've made to put more rubble. And it takes time to, to do all of this. And there's very little in terms of construction equipment. And um, this is something uh, Arab gave me some money to, Daji Dewari. It's a construction type found in Kashmir. And you can find it in Portugal. You can find it in Turkey. You found it in Haiti find it in France, Germany, and it's a timber frame filled with masonry, or in the case of Pakistan, it's filled with stone. And, you know, the general engineering community's view is that it doesn't work. It's a vernacular construction. It's, you know, it's not code-based. So uh, I applied internally with an Arab for some funding, and uh, a few years ago, they gave me some funding. So we built a detailed, non-linear model. Well, we've modeled the bricks. We've modeled the brick. Uh, the bricks, the timber, the joints, the nails are in there, the metal sheeting is in there, the nails that connect the metal sheets to the roof purlins are all in there, and we applied very large earthquakes to it. And you can see the one with a little bit of nailing. It really doesn't do that badly. And that was under a Zone 4 UBC 97 earthquake with full near source factors. So, and you know, after we did this work, we found that one of the universities, Peshawar in Pakistan, had done some testing. And we compared our analysis model that we had done in total isolation and ignorance of each other's work. And it wasn't a bad match. And the hysteresis groups also matched. Um, what I can offer to people is if anybody wants to do some more research in this or a project and take the analysis files, uh, they are welcome to uh, do so. Uh, I have the models. I'm free to share them with anybody. So if you want it as a project and you think you can take it on, uh, talk to me. Um, a few things about they teach us, you know, you, you need, you know, strong openings, right? I mean, the only thing that stood up on this building are the openings, the window frame. And, you know, when we study engineering, they tell us openings are points of weakness, right? But in this case, the solid corner wall was the point of weakness. The large opening was the strong bit. And in this case, too, I mean, apart from the window that was a timber carpentry piece with wooden shutters, there's nothing that's holding that roof up. So sometimes good carpentry window fittings might just be what you need. And you've got buildings like this. I mean, is it the bookshelves that have helped this building in part? I don't know, but a lot of stuff around it had collapsed. And then things like this stand up. I mean, in, you know, these things do stand up, and you would never, in your sensible mind, want to detail a structure like that. Uh, so, yeah, the UN was very helpful in Haiti. They flew us in and out of uh, Santo Domingo in Dominican Republic. Uh, Joe De Silva, Kathy Gibbs, Victoria Bachelor, three people say thank you to. Uh, Kathy came with me to Haiti and was tremendously helpful. And uh, Joe and Victoria helped with the report. So it's on the ERI website. There's some images here. Just um, at the end of the day, it's about humans and it's about homes. The earthquake engineering is really a, just a small part in what makes homes and communities.
and uh, so some of the artwork that you can find on the side of the street. Um, I, I failed to organize my time to find time to buy one because I had to go to the airport. But um, you know, it's some of it is creative. We were actually wondering who's going to produce the first artwork about the earthquake. Six weeks, seven weeks after the earthquake, I didn't see a single piece. I suppose it was existing inventory. Um, so uh, that's my talk. Um, thank you. If you've got any questions. Mm -hmm. um, so in Pakistan, it looks like you uh, presented uh, training to some of the local people there. And do you know if there's any projects uh, that you yourself or colleagues um, have been doing in Haiti, or do you know of anyone else working on something like that? Do you think it would be uh, well received? I think it would be very well received. It's about finding funds to pay for the right people to go into the field for six months, three months, nine months to implement uh, that type of stuff. And it needs to be in a French-speaking person, Creole with help, and it needs to be within the context of modifying the building stock that's in Haiti. You know, I think going in there heavy-handed, oh, we do it like this in Europe or like that in Japan, it only gets a certain amount of traction. You have to build up on what they have. And absolutely, uh, you know, we have helped out a number of aid agencies since, uh, formally and informally, with advice and reviews. But we're not the ones with the, the budgets. The governments, the World Bank, the UN, NGOs, INGOs, typically they're the ones with the budgets. You have to influence private home builders as well as public office builders. Do you think that there's a, uh, a time window that uh, you go in there and have maximum? I mean, obviously, they've already rebuilt. And uh, uh, they'll, they'll be rebuilding for the next five to ten years. Uh, in Pakistan, the reconstruction has taken five years. And that Daji Dewari house, the timber stone building, and they've built over 100,000 of those. And if you take roughly seven people a house in that, social setting. That's nearly a million people in a house made out of timber and stone for which there are some guidelines based on pictorial images and sort of rules of thumb and all this seems sensible. There are no codes for it. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the Haitian context, yeah, next five to ten years, plenty of scope for helping. Stoneway, stone yeah. masonry. Yeah. I'm, I'm just wondering if, if you have seen any recent efforts in this area. But the, the, the formal engineering community is very dismissive of anything traditional. Stone masonry is assumed to be primitive. You know, we study carbon fiber wrapping and uh, epoxy doweled this, that, and the other with stainless steel dampers and shock absorbers and base isolation. That's what we come to learn because that's innovative, that's new. A lot of the world can't ever afford that. And so you don't ever study stone masonry. You don't study traditional timber construction, carpentry. So you don't know as an engineer how to build a timber house without the way it is practiced in California, which is with all the metal plates and the nail guns and the anchor bolts. And that's how timber housing is built here. A lot of the world is surprised that most of the building stock in North America is timber. They assume it's all concrete, but it isn't. So guidelines, codes, they have their place, but uh, most of the people in a setting like this could never read the code, could never employ the engineer to implement the code, couldn't afford the quality of construction that would come with codes. So you have to decide as a society, as a community, where do you, what's your entry level in terms of quality? And uh, I suppose I'm making the suggestion that you can get a very long way by modifying the construction practices of the people who build themselves. And also the key carpenters, masons, steel fixers, shutterers, the people who just hands on, they're the guys who go and procure the material. They're the ones who probably influence the building layout and put it all together. 
So, um, you know, what's the point in talking to engineers who don't build houses? Because it's being physically put together by labourers and craftsmen. So a code has its place. Engineers should absolutely know about them and strive to implement them. And in a community like here, or in Western Europe or Japan, it's relatively easy to do so, because there is a social development and backup to do that. In a setting like Haiti or different countries, the context is very different. So saying you have to do a code-compliant building is probably as unhelpful as you can be, because everybody knows, yeah, <laughs> sure, it would be a nice thing to do, but you can't achieve it. And then if, you, if that's your entry argument, you alienate uh, the majority of the population, whereas your ambition is actually to be helpful. So you have to find that entry level where you can help. So the work that NSET do with the shake table testing or the workshops I did with the carpenters and masons, you know, people can relate to that. And they build a stone wall and they build it wrong and you knock it down and they understand how it fell apart pretty quickly, right? And then you put it back together properly and it suddenly holds a lot better. And they can, you know, it's Im immediate feedback. I know it's an improvement of what they have, but I don't know if uh, there are another endpoint with die people again, and I sure. don't know how. I, I think there is, um, when you teach simple rules, you're trying to teach the limitations of what you can do with this type of construction. So, you know, it's for a fairly small house, one to two stories. You don't want 12 meter rooms. You know, they are small rooms, the spans are small, the walls are relatively thick. So if you were to calculate the mass of the building and divide it by the cross-sectional area of the walls, you'll end up with a very low shear stress. So even if the shear capacity of the wall is really low, you're not actually asking it to do that much, and that's how you deal with it. And if you look at stone bridges, uh, stone masonry bridges, I mean, Europe is full of them. A lot of the roads and um, railway bridges are all stone masonry with rubble infill. They were properly engineered, but it is stone. So and you know they take lorries and all sorts of traffic now so you can make good quality stone masonry have you been again in the Pakistan to see how it's everything like after your classes and the other people uh, how is developing through the years in there is like the, they follow the same or have been again moving yeah. to the past or giving more span, like you said, because at the beginning they, they understand what is happening because it's in his mind, but the time passed, they will go back to maybe to his old yeah. habits or they start to doing more aggressive structures. Like, um, I think, uh, I mean, in, in, I mean, it's a very good question, and it's that institutional memory, social values, it's an opportunity for the whole country. I think, uh, unfortunately, probably lots of Pakistans saw it as a local problem. And if you were in Peshawar, you were probably perceiving it that it wasn't, uh, your building did fine. And it's just that, well, the earthquake didn't hit you, right? That's why your building did fine. And it was the same issue in Haiti. The, lots of people left Port-au-Prince and moved to their neighbors or to their friends who live outside town who buildings hadn't been damaged. Not because the buildings were safer, it's just that the earthquake was you know, 100 kilometers further away from there, so the damage was significant. Um, people do become complacent, and then in these countries, you know, the day-to-day -day struggle to make ends meet and face hurricanes and floods in Pakistan and places, um, you know, there are constantly things that override your planning response. So that, that's, that's a difficult context in which to operate and you become vulnerable and because you're vulnerable you're more vulnerable and you need to find a way to, to break, that break that circle. Um, I think Pakistan has another opportunity now because of the floods to understand the importance of master planning uh, and all that entails because if you put people and they live in floodplains then it doesn't matter which country it is, there's going to be uh, difficulties with that. Um, you know, and countries make choices, and s individuals make choices. I mean, the same guy who went and to saw the gingerbread houses, he went and looked at some of the UNESCO buildings in Pakistan recently. They were all fine. They were all built on high ground, traditional old 
You know, these are listed, wonderful sites. So in olden times, people did build them on high ground, generally. So I suppose it's a population issue too. People do need a place to live, and agriculture and water, they go hand in hand, and people live in those places. It's uh, 10 to 8, so uh, any more questions, or we can talk informally afterwards? Um, Once again, I think we should uh, thank our speaker. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.